Sakana AI just released another step in the direction of fully autonomous, self-improving artificial intelligence. This is the holy grail of AI. This is called the Darwin Girdle Machine, and it uses a combination of previously theorized methods of self-improving code mixed with evolutionary mechanics like Darwin's theory of evolution. And with these two concepts put together, they have seen massive self-improvements in benchmarks like Sweebench and Ader Polyglot. So I'm gonna break this paper down for you, but first, of course I need to talk about the intelligence explosion again. I know you're probably sick of hearing me talk about it, but it really seems like we are at the inflection point, right at that point at which we have self-improving artificial intelligence, that is AI that can discover new knowledge and apply it to itself, getting better in a recursive fashion. And once we achieve that, that's when we're gonna have the intelligence explosion. And so we've seen a number of different papers and projects lately. We've had the AI scientist also from Sakana AI. We've had Alpha Evolve from Google. Alpha Evolve was able to discover improvements in Google's hardware algorithms that allowed for a meaningful percent increase in performance across their entire fleet of servers. It was also able to figure out more efficient ways to do matrix multiplication. So imagine we take all of these discoveries and then it applies it to itself and then continues. And then at that point, we have this exponential compounding improvement. All right, so the gist, what are we actually talking about here? The Darwin Girdle Machine, DGM, is a novel self-improving system that iteratively modifies its own code and empirically validates each change using coding benchmarks. I'm gonna explain all of this in really simple terms. Just stick with me. All right, so large language models have been an incredible innovation over the last few years, but they have one big limitation and it's us, humans. The only way for these large language models to get better, whether we're talking about pre-training methods, post-training algorithms, it all requires human innovation and human application. Most of today's AI systems remain bound by fixed, human-designed architectures that learn within predefined boundaries without the capacity to autonomously rewrite their own source code to self-improve. Each advancement in AI development still leans heavily on human interventions, tethering the pace of progress. Now, let me give you a related analogy. The most recent major innovation in artificial intelligence was reinforcement learning with verifiable rewards. That is because we're able to post-train the model to become thinking models Without human intervention, the verifiable rewards means that we can tell the model if it's giving us the right answer or the wrong answer without a human needing to self-label it. That's because we know, does two plus two equal four? Yes, okay, model, you got that right. That is the verifiable reward part. So when you remove humans from the loop, you are able to scale up performance much more quickly. One can imagine an AI system that, like scientific discovery itself, becomes an engine of its own advancement. Now, this isn't the first time something like this has been proposed. In fact, it's part of the name of the Darwin Girdle machine. Girdle. Now, the Girdle machine was proposed back in 2007. It was theoretical and proposed an approach to self-improving AI capable of modifying itself in a provably beneficial matter. Now, that provably is the important part. And the reason it's important is because it's kind of impossible to show provably before an evolution that it is better than the previous version. This original formulation is in practice impossible to create due to the inability to prove the impact of most self-modifications. It's basically trying to predict, is this next version of myself going to be better or worse? That's not how evolution works. How evolution works is some random modification happens and the real world puts it to the test. If all of a sudden a frog develops the ability to change its color to better blend in with its environment, that frog is going to live longer, it's going to reproduce more, and then evolution takes over from there. That's obviously a hyper oversimplification of evolution, but generally speaking, that's what's happening. And so before that new evolution of frog was born, it didn't try to predict if being able to change its colors was gonna be beneficial or not, it would be impossible. And so that's why the girdle machine originally wasn't really practical. But what if we take that evolutionary system 
and apply it to the girdle machine rather than trying to provably predict if an evolution is going to be beneficial or not. What if we just generate it and test it in the real world? That's exactly what the GDM does. So instead of requiring formal proofs, we empirically validate self modifications against a benchmark, allowing the system to improve and explore based on observed results. That is an important improvement to the girdle machine, really a critical improvement. Now, listen to this. This approach mirrors biological evolution, where mutations and adaptations are not verified in advance, but are produced, trialed, and then selected via natural selection. And I posted this on X yesterday. Modeling AI systems after natural systems is likely the way to go. And by the way, if you're not following me on X, please do at Matthew Berman. But it's not just coming up with random changes, testing them, and then moving on to the next one because that would actually cause problems, which I'll get into in a minute. In fact, they took a much more similar approach to Darwinian evolution. We take inspiration from Darwinian evolution and investigate the effectiveness of maintaining a library of previously discovered agents to serve as stepping stones for future generations. So even if they find an evolution and it isn't quite as good as some other variation, they don't just throw it away. They keep it and consider it for future evolution. So that's where the Darwin girdle machine comes in. It is a self-referential, self-improving system that writes and modifies its own code to become a better coding agent. So a lot of high level language here. I really want to show you kind of the details, the nitty gritty of how this stuff works. So let me paint the picture first. We have the archive of all evolutions. We have the parents that give birth to the child. Then we have some variation of the parent. It self modifies itself. It doesn't try to predict whether it's going to work or not. It just makes the change, proposes a change, makes the change. Then it writes all of that to itself. So it changes its core code. Then it evaluates against a benchmark like SWE bench and Ader polyglot and decides, is it better? Is it worse? and it adds it to the archive. And then it just does that over and over again. And hopefully each evolution is better than the previous generation. And eventually at the end, it sees a big performance bump. And spoiler alert, it actually did. Okay, so how does it actually work? Let's get into the specifics. The DGM is initialized with only one coding agent. Remember, each generation, the parent, is just a coding agent. That is a large language model wrapped with scaffolding. That is tools, memory, whatever else there is. It is just that core LLM wrapped into an agent. And its progression is evaluated on coding benchmarks. A coding agent is defined as a single system implemented with a code repository and powered by frozen pre-trained foundation models. Why do they say frozen? Well, that's the part that doesn't evolve. They are using just a core foundation model. It turns out it's Claude 3.5 Sonnet new. And it actually talks about the fact that in future papers, they're going to explore actually updating the foundation model. But for this paper, for not making it overly complicated, they froze the foundation model. That does not change. Only the code around it, only the tools it has access to. So these agents have the capability of reading, writing, and executing code. They also talk about this meta learning that has been happening for a while now. So that is prompts, workflows, and tools. The scaffolding around the large language model. When you improve those things, the overall performance of the model improves as well. And so they define self-improvement as the coding task that involves modifying the design of an agent's own components, i.e. its own code. So the prompts, the workflows, and the tools. So then starting from that coding agent, that initial coding agent, the DGM builds an archive of all discovered agents. In each iteration, the DGM selects parent agents to self-modify and branch off to produce new agents. Each selected parent analyzes its own benchmark evaluation logs proposes the next feature to implement and receives this proposal as a problem statement to execute. The parent then implements the suggested feature into its own code base, generating a new coding agent. Each newly generated agent is quantitatively evaluated on a chosen coding benchmark to estimate its coding abilities. So that's the process in which a coding agent starts to multiply. Then the foundation model has access to two tools initially. So a bash tool for executing bash commands, that just means controlling your console, and an edit tool for viewing and editing directories and entire files. 
That's it. Those are the only tools it has available in that initial agent. But of course, it can write its own tools now. The agent receives a single input prompt that specifies the location of the target repository, the problem statement, and the repository's testing framework. We run the DGM for 80 iterations with two iterations running in parallel for Sweebench and four for Polyglot. All of this powered by Claude 3.5 Sonnet New. All right, let's talk about some of the results now. So what we see up here at the top is the state of the art, whatever the best model was at the time. Then we have DGM. So first DGM without open-ended exploration, meaning it's really just the foundation model. And as we can see here, after a number of iterations, it gets a little bit better, but really just plateaus immediately. Then in green, we have DGM without self-improve. So it has open-ended exploration, but does not have self-improve. And as we can see here, it does pretty well, some nice gains, and then it plateaus. But when given open-ended exploration and self-improvement, this blue line right here, we see increased performance over time to nearly the state-of-the-art performance. So after 80 iterations of the DGM, the coding agent's performance increases from 20% to 50% on Sweebench and 14% to 38% on Polyglot. Those are massive gains by just allowing these models to iterate on their own. So here's what the DGM archive tree looks like. You start with an initial agent, then you start spawning the variations of that agent, proposing different changes, implementing them, and then benchmarking against them. And as you can see, the ones that did well will continue to spawn all the way down to where this star is right here, which is the final best agent. And remember, it keeps track of all of the different evolutions along the way. On Polyglot, although the DGM starts with an initial agent whose performance is lower than that of Ader, it discovers an agent that far surpasses Ader. And Ader is a very, very good coding agent. And here's the key. While the state-of-the-art Sweebench agent and Ader were painstakingly shaped by human efforts, the DGM hints at a future in which such ingenuity is automated, evolving through self-referential cycles and continuous self-improvements. So the DGM evolves its tools, it evolves its workflows, and just gets better. But remember, the core model, the foundation model powering all of it stays the same. And I want to pause here for a second because this is important. A lot of the benchmarks that we have now are completely saturated by these models. And we're still seeing nice performance bumps in these models, but not like it was from GPT 3.5 to GPT 4. These models are already incredibly capable. In fact, I've made the argument that 95 to 98% of all use cases are completely achievable with the intelligence of current models. We don't need massive gains in the core intelligence anymore. Obviously for the most sophisticated use cases, sure, but for the majority of use cases, we've already achieved saturation. What we need now is massive investment in the tooling around it, the scaffolding, whether that's evolution systems like the Darwin Girdle machine, whether it's memory, tooling like the MCP protocol, web browsing, collaboration between agents, that is where the massive investment needs to be. Because again, the core intelligence of the models are already there. All right, so what did it actually do? What did it change? Well, here are a couple example improvements that it figured out, proposed, and validated on its own. So for example, the DGM enhanced the edit tool to allow more granular file viewing by lines and more precise file editing by string replacement instead of always viewing or replacing the entire file. And then also here's an example of workflow improvements, making multiple attempts to solve a task and using another foundation model to evaluate and select the best solution. It also considered previous attempts when generating subsequent ones. And the reason why open-ended exploration, keeping track of all the previous evolutions is important is because if you just head down one evolution track, you might get stuck in a local maximum, meaning you found whatever is best for that single track, but you may have missed other tracks that maybe started out more slowly, but all of a sudden performed best in the end. They call this deceptive dips or peaks in performance. And the cool thing is this framework, the DGM, is actually generalizable beyond just the model that they tested. They tested a bunch of different models and the performance was the same. They saw big gains in improvement. And not only in Python, which was the language that they chose for this experiment, they tried other languages and it worked also very well. So now 
let's talk about safety because of course if we're talking about the intelligence explosion we're going to have super intelligence and we need to talk about safety this capability referring to ggm introduces unique safety considerations stemming from the system's ability to autonomously modify its own code if it can modify its own code we need to keep a close eye on it modifications optimized solely for benchmark performance might inadvertently introduce vulnerabilities or behaviors misaligned with human intentions even if they improve the target Target metric. This sure sounds like reward hacking to me. And as a reminder, reward hacking means the reward system we set up to tell a model whether it's doing better or worse becomes hacked because they found a loophole. An example, which I've used before, but I'm going to use again, is the boating video game that OpenAI published a few years ago. They were trying to train AI to get the highest score in a boat racing game. And of course you think, well, it's a boat racing game, so the ultimate objective is to win the race. But what they were using as the reward signal is the number of points generated by the AI in the game. And the model figured out that if it simply went around in circles and hit a bunch of obstacles, it was getting points for that. And it would actually get more points than just finishing the race. That is a reward hack. And so if we have self-evolving systems, we need to make sure that the benchmark that we're testing against, the reward, is well-aligned, well-defined, because otherwise it might find ways to hack that reward and we would have unintended consequences. Self-improvement loop could amplify misalignment over successive generations. So how do they actually add safety to this system? All agent execution and self-modification processes are conducted within isolated sandbox environments. So they can only change so much, they can only go so far. Each execution within the sandbox is subjected to a strict time limit, reducing the risk of resource exhaustion or unbounded behavior. The self-improvement process is currently confined to the well-defined domain of enhancing performance on specific coding benchmarks by modifying the agent's own Python code base, thus limiting the scope of potential modifications. So that is the Darwin Girdle machine. This is proof that we can have self-improving artificial intelligence. Now, of course, it still needs to get better. We still need to throw a whole bunch of compute behind it, but it really does seem like we're starting to see little hints here and there that we are at that inflection point of self-improving AI, also known as the intelligence explosion. Now, I'm gonna leave you with one last thing. Remember I mentioned that the only thing that is not evolving in this system is the foundation model itself. Now, think about that Alpha Evolve paper in which it discovered for the first time in 50 years a more efficient way to do matrix multiplication. Imagine taking that and applying it to the foundation model. Imagine the AI being able to pre-train another version of its foundation model or post-train it and evolve the core intelligence of the entire scaffolding. Now that could be the last piece missing for the intelligence explosion. If you enjoyed this video, please consider giving a like and subscribe and I'll see you in the next one.